How strong is Hajime? Part 2. Adi Furuta, all his OP weapons and equipment explained by any news. Let's see what he has to say. Hajime may have all these skills and abilities that make him damn near godlike, but a large majority of his raw power comes from his creations. And they don't fucking explain that shit, and I'm just left there wondering what the fuck is this new weapon? Like the satellite beam laser cannon, bro. What is that? His massive arsenal of weapons, vehicles, and equipment that he seems to rely on more than his extremely overpowered ancient magic. The man can literally manipulate the very fundamentals of reality, yet for some reason he prefers to just shoot things instead. Is that- That's not to say I'm complaining. Why, why does he do that? I never really thought about it. Why does he only shoot guns? Like, does he just love that gun theme? Seems like episode- and It'd be cool if it, like, was discovered that he, he's a weeb, right? He's a huge weeb. He loves watching anime. So therefore, maybe he watched a lot of anime about guns. So now it's, like, heavily themed by guns. He wants to, like, you know, copy his anime characters that use guns. But I, why are they always guns? I mean, it's a unique taste. I think the whole concept of guns in this, like, and in this isekai world where everyone's fighting with swords and shit and it's just like the ancient times i think it's pretty it's pretty cool planning but i just think it's a bit of a roundabout method for someone who has abilities on par with rimuru he does start to imbue a lot of his later weapons with ancient magic capabilities but that's a whole new level of power that we won't see for a while it, is that season Maybe that's after the training arc with Oscar. Maybe he learned something else. I haven't seen it in season two. So, based on how far we are in the anime, let's take a look at exactly what his current arsenal is capable of. The collection of weapons we've seen so much, along with a powerful few that the anime unfortunately skipped over. There's more? But first, anime skipped? This video is sponsored by Rage Shadow Legends. Use your discount code hashtag Kaka for your free temple on Tales of Luminaria. Go, go download, guys. But now. Let's get back to the video. Starting with Hajime's very first creation, what we have is his go-to revolver, Donner. A modern weapon crafted from the hardest and most dense materials in the labyrinth that possesses enough power to fire projectiles faster than the speed of sound. People are saying Donner, even though it's a revolver, is more strength than this, like a, a regular sniper gun. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard someone say it. It may just seem like a normal revolver in the anime, but there are several factors that go towards making this far more powerful than the world's strongest anti-tank rifle. Right here. This exact comparison. Yes, this is it. Annie must have said it in the previous video. First, the bullets are made from that same dense material. The tar stone which ranks just below diamond on the moss scales of hardness. Combine this with the blast rock explosion to propel it forward, and what you'll get is a durable shot that can penetrate pretty much all types of armor and monster flesh. Where Hajime takes it one step further, though, is through the acceleration mm -hmm. of that bullet via his lightning field skill. Right, it's almost like a railgun, the way that he uses it, like lightning magic onto it. By applying lightning fields to the barrel of his gun, not only does the revolver it's become faster? something more akin to a railgun, but the resulting projectile would travel faster than 3 kilometers a second. And someone said, by using that lightning field, you somehow cancel out the, uh, the recoil. So whenever he's shooting guns, like a sniper, one-handed, and he just does this, and there's movement. It's actually like, oh, he's, there's just no recoil. And then someone else said, actually... It's just because Hajime is super strong, but that person got debunked because it turns out, no, it actually is the lightning field property. Giving it power befitting the German word its name is based off of. One key thing to note about this gun, though, is that the bullets required for it are very difficult to make. Before Hajime had acquired his duplicate transmutation skill, to craft each individual bullet took upwards of 30 minutes. That's just how much precision was needed when making sure the size and shape were 100. So, like... You know that machine gun, the Gatling gun that we have? Does he individually make all those bullets? I guess he has to, huh? I mean, how else is he going to get the fucking bullets? So, sometimes he just sits there just making bullets all fucking day. I mean, it's not fun to show him the enemy, but I swear to God, this guy never runs out of bullets. 100% accurate. Reloading was also quite difficult given he only had one arm, but the development of various gun kata techniques alongside various other things did make it a lot- Wait, wait, wait. Gun kata. Martial arts involving firearms. Now that is some fucking nerdy ass weeb shit I love. So alongside various other things did make it a lot- Might as well be called fucking gun swordsmanship, you know? It's, it's pretty much just a gun swordsmanship. Well, he does do that. He applies like that. He killed that bear. He got those like cutting magic and then he imbues it on the sword so it can be used like pretty much like a sword. A lot more easy for him. So with that being Donner and Schlag, next we have the railgun enhanced anti-tank rifle Schlagen. A single-shot rifle Hajime deemed necessary to make after having fought the Scorpion. 
The way it worked was pretty much the same as Donner and Schlag, but the wider and longer barrel meant that- I feel like Schlagen got power creep by pile driver pretty quick. And the sniper, we don't see it as much. I think it earlier it mattered a lot. I think earlier it was like a trump card, but then... I, th I, I think like... Donner is always around. Donner is always around, but then sometimes I feel like the sniper one kind of got power creep. It doesn't, you know, it's not there as much anymore. That larger caliber bullets could be accelerated across a greater area, resulting in a shot that was at least six times stronger than the revolvers. Damn. Then, just like before, the bolts for this were crafted with as much precision as humanly possible. Tar was used for the shell's core, then an additional layer of even denser material was coated to harden it. Once the perfect amount of blast rock was packed into the casing, Hajime would then possess the ideal FMJ bullets he'd always wanted. Now, Full Metal Jacket, FMJ. That was like a fucking add-on in Modern Warfare 2. What does it do? It breaks through walls. Yes, I think it does that, yes. It may have been a little hard to judge in the anime, but a shot from this was deemed to be more powerful than even a battleship round. That's why it's his go-to weapon when facing off against enemies whose armor is a Xantium level. It provides a that addition- the hardest substance in the world. Didn't even know. ...penetrative power that Donner and Schlag simply can't. Stepping aside from Hajime's weapons now, next we have his prosthetic parts of Demon Eye and Cyborg Arm. Self-made okay. artifacts that do much more than what the real ones ever could have. The arm has like a shotgun in the back, right? Like, it's like a, it's like a shotgun propelled punch, I'm pretty sure. So, if we start with the arm, by infusing it with mana then filling it with pseudo nerves, Hajime could move and feel with it just like before. The only difference is that this one was reinforced with several types of- What the fuck is a pseudo nerve? Now, I don't have to make it make sense. But I'm just thinking, this is just a prosthetic arm. How did he get all this nerve attachment back? Pseudo nerves. Don't worry about it. Specialized doors, and somehow he'd found a way to install a shotgun into it. As for the eye, well, after losing his real one in the fight with the Hydra, yeah, Hashimei decided to make up for it by imbuing a divinity stone with detect magic and foresight resulting in this artificial eye that could see much more than just a normal one. Of course, the addition of pseudo nerves allowed images to be sent- Whenever he takes that eye patch off and we see like the ruby crystal in his eye, it kind of freaks me out sometimes. It's like, oh yeah, I forget that's there. ...directly to his brain, but these additional enhancements also allowed him to see the flow and strength of mana as well. Everything from the color and element of a spell, all the way to the very core bringing it into existence, could now be perceived and manipulated by Hajime. So, should anyone ever try to cast a spell in Hajime's vicinity, then knows. Hajime could easily disrupt its creation by shooting- This is straight up, this is Mahoka stuff, right? This is exactly how Onisama, like, is able to, like, counter and even, like, stop spells from even happening, right? It's core. It's an aspect to combat that he didn't even know was possible. As for the reason he chooses to cover it with an eye patch, well, looks cool. that's simply due to the Divinity Stone's natural properties. Because of its high concentration of mana, Hajime's demon eye was always giving off this faint blue glow. Great! Something he couldn't Look at figure it. out how to get rid of and didn't really feel like dealing with- I mean, the design looks fucking sick. Whenever, like, an eye is glowing and, and as, like, a- There's usually, like- Look at the line of blue here, right? It kind of shows that he's turning his head. I love stuff like this in anime. Whenever there's, like, a- the, the eye is, like, it's glowing. And then there's, like, a trail of the laser effect of where it travels from. They do that a lot in Eminence and Shadow 2, actually, whenever there's like really serious moments. I personally love it, but I guess you can't always be like this. If it was out in the open. But anyway, it was around this same time that Hashime would also come across an artifact known as the Treasure Trove. A ring-shaped support for a magical ruby, which was capable of creating this artificial dimensional space for storage. When did that happen? Was that in the first labyrinth? I've completely forgot about that. I just kind of went, and went along with it. It's like, oh, we can just fucking port over in the machines and just store everything. Which... Hajime wasn't entirely sure how big the space really was, but it was certainly large enough to store all his weapons, tools, and crafting materials. I feel like this this is straight up just a uh, spatial magic, bro. I swear to god, this is like a spatial magic. Ancient spatial magic, it's not really, but you know. Materials. So anytime we see him pull a weapon or vehicle out of thin air, that's him withdrawing it from the dimensional space this ring provides. His dimensional garage. Anything within one meter of the ring could be deposited or withdrawn at will. Now, switching back to could you enter that realm? I'm just trying to think of like other really hack ways of using this. Like what if you like you're in a battle? It does use spatial magic? Huh. But what if like you're in a battle and like you're about to lose? Something dangerous is happening, so you decide to like jump into your dimensional garage. Can you just do that? How does that work? I have no clue. It was weapons. It was during this time that Hajime had also created a Gatlin gun and rocket launcher. The minigun Metsudai was designed for situations when there were simply too many enemies. 
After his run-in with the Raptors, Hajime didn't want to feel overwhelmed by sheer numbers ever again. Ah, So, by creating Raptors. this real gun enhanced Gatlin gun, Hajime could now fire 12,000 30mm rounds a minute for an absolute Jesus. max of 5 minutes. That may not seem like a very long time, but- No, if it's constant shooting for 5 minutes, that's kind of fucking insane. 60,000 rounds- This is what we used to just clear off the, um, the people, the monsters that was like attacking us during the Shimuzu arc, right? The traitor. The other traitor, right? Earlier on in season 1. And then we used this to clear off the stadium of all the zombies too. Of like the necromancer zombies. This weapon is pretty fucking useful. It's- It's- It's useful? I think it's just fucking- Something about- a Gatling gun shooting all these different bullets. Like, look, these are CGI's bullets coming out. With something about the sheer raw power and the frequency of all these bullets, it's like like that. It makes it very intimidating. Gun enhanced bullets is more than enough to take on entire armies. I'm sure it does well to live up to its English name of butchery. Once it reaches that five minutes, though, even with its specialized barrels made from rare self-cooling ore, it just the heat up. would simply become way too much to handle. So much so that the gun can't even be used for a very long time after. Pretty sure we even see the gun itself like glowing red in the anime. I'm pretty sure I've seen like a panel like this in the anime where it's less like this. It's more like sharp. It's more sharp. It looks like a jagged knife. As for the rocket launcher Orkin, this was more of the AOE solution to the being outnumbered problem. This is what Shea likes Should to use. Should there ever come a time when Metsudai wasn't enough, then Orkin can follow it up with 12 consecutive I love this missile. Type yeah, this is great. Necessary. It's the last weapon we see Jeez. him make before leaving the labyrinth. In terms of other miscellaneous things that you- Right here, right here, right here. This is the exact animation I'm talking about. He imbued the grizzly bear- Sorry, the grizzly bear lightning claw- No, the grizzly bear claw magic thing onto the gun and is able to fucking cut the grass like this. This is the exact scene I question. How the fuck is he cutting blades of grass with this gun? ...we consider useful. There were also the two Azantium armored vehicles of Steif and Brise, as well as 12 vials of the remaining Ambrosia from the Divinity Stone. Steif was his two-wheel mana-powered motorcycle. Stiff? By using mana as fuel- <laughs> This motorcycle is just to stiff? Hajime could apply his mana manipulation skill to directly control the speed of it. The more mana he put in, then the faster Steif would go and vice versa. An interesting thing to note about how it runs is that, in order to ensure the ground it's traversing is mostly flat, a special enchantment has been added which smooths the ground ahead before the wheels can even reach it. What? Making for a relatively comfy ride in what the would The ground gets softer? Now, I don't what? think there's any weapons installed into this one, but Hashime definitely made sure to make up for that in his four-wheeler Brisa. In fact, the only reason he'd even given this Hummer a trunk in the first place was just so he could sit in the back and fire his Gatlin gun if he ever needed to. But aside from that same smoothing mechanism and his anti armor, Brisa also boasts right several- Right here, right here, right here, right here. You see, I swear to God, every fucking vehicle, maybe minus the uh, the motorcycle, Hajime has like a button, he presses beep, and then something opens up and it's always just fucking missile cannons everywhere, bro. I swear to God, this SUV has it, the submarine has it, and I think that's pretty much it. I hope the motorcycle gets it too, but I swear to God, like, we just press a button and then this missile thing just pop out of nowhere. I, it's been done so many times turrets and rocket launchers. There's a smaller capacity version of Ortican, as well as a mounted version of Schlagen, both of which could be activated and fired at any time via Hajime's Oh, mana that's a mounted version of the sniper! So, Risa was pretty much this indestructible tank. The manga makes it look a lot beefier. The anime just looks like a fucking Hummer. One that could likely deal with every known monster in the entire world. The only setback is that, just like Steif, only people like Hajime can use it. The fact that it runs on mana means that only those with direct mana manipulation can even start it. In any case, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, but those 12 vials of Ambrosia are Hajime's only lifeline. Yes, there does exist basic- We only have 12 of those vials. Huh. It's never really mentioned how many we carry on at the same time. Like, how many we have left or stuff like that. We never talk about the scarcity. I never realized there were such important, like, this, and he's saying, Ambrosia, the 12 of them, are Hajime's only life. That's kind of insane. I never really thought about like how important they were. I didn't even, even know what they were, actually. I thought they were just random potion that Hajime was able to make. ...forms of healing magic, but that definitely wouldn't be enough for anyone who's strong enough to put Hajime in a near-death situation. So, by having these 12 vials available, Hajime can either choose to recover from any near- Are we keeping count right now of how many Hajime has left of this? Fatal injury 12 times, or use it to save someone who's about to die just like how he did with Meld. 
it's a very limited resource that should be considered a big deal whenever it's used. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also this cheat that ensures people won't die so long as there's still some of it left. Now, moving- How many do we have left? No, that's- I, I feel like that is such an important thing that we should be keeping account of, but anime doesn't give a fuck. The anime just uses it sometimes. I never realized how important it was. I just thought it was just like OP potions that Hajime had, like just uh, it's an endless amount of. But I should be, I feel like we should be keeping count of this. Maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I feel like how it, it doesn't do the author any good, but the people could go back and count how many times that we've used it. I don't know, but that's kind of insane. Moving on to when Hajime was traversing the second labyrinth, and that's when we get our first look at the pile bunker. A 2.5 meter tall cannon at I thought this is called a pile driver. Never mind, it's a pile bunker. Attached to his arm that's used yeah. to penetrate even the most sturdy of defenses. Even Teo's asshole, the most sturdy, the black dragon's bussy. But this is, I think, the strongest weapon we have. By making use of his compression synthesis derivative skill, Hashime was able to make a four ton spike consisting purely of Azantium. So, that was a four ton spike? We straight up just like dug a four ton spike metal rod into this dragon bussy, and in the season finale, we got something even bigger. Hajime specifically said, I'll grab something even bigger than last time. With all that mass being cut. How the f That's even more impressive that you're just carrying four ton around like this. The casually. Actually, that's kind of insane. I know he's super strong, but that's, in that's actually insane. Four tons right here. Condensed into a small one meter by 20 centimeters. Here we go! State, this was by far the hardest and most dense object on the entire planet. It's the ultimate defense breaker when accelerated via lightning field and a blast rock explosion. And we use it on fucking Tio's asshole. The strongest, most hardest piercing weapon that we have. Used on Tio's asshole as comedy. Insane. That said, given the amount of prep needed to ensure a proper hit, it wasn't necessarily the greatest for every situation. Yeah, Unless we have to, like, the target was already in. We have to like tie them down first, right? You can't just like always use it. You gotta like break their weakness. You gotta get like a stagger break, and then you like mount them with this and use it. It hasn't really failed so far. It's pretty much used on. Like, if it lands, it pretty much does its job, right? I think did it land on Freed? I forget the fight with Freed, but it worked on Noint. Capacitated, then it'd be tough to get enough time to fix the anchors, charge the spike, then fire it at them, thus making it less than optimal for moving targets. Mm. I think this is in place as like a nerf because it's otherwise it's too OP. If you could always just use this without little to no limitations, then you can just spam it. But because it's like, all right, you can only, it's like a, almost like a one shot kill, but it's, it's like a finisher. You need to like weaken the enemy first to the point they can even get prepped to it. So I, I, I like the balance there. It's like, you can't always use it, but you can use it if you actually beat your opponent to a sense. Now, before we get to Hajime's next weapon, we Space first satellite. need to talk about his use of golems. Reason being that the way- Talk about the bits. I still don't really know what the bits are. These work coincide heavily with the functionality of his next creations. So, as we saw in the anime, these mechanical birds were capable of flying and performing recon. Mm. A feat that wouldn't normally be possible if not for two key factors. His eye. The first is the imbuing of some gravity magic enchantments, then the second is the embedding of a spirit stone. No, the okay, enchantment never mind. is what allows these drones to defy gravity, while the spirit stone is the tool that lets them be controlled remotely. You see, if two spirit stones are filled with the same type of mana, then the stone Hajime keeps with him can be used to remotely control the stone embedded into the drone. So just use the same stone, and Hajime can control every one of them, like a hive mind. So that's how Hajime is able to fly them remotely. If we take that same concept and apply it to something a bit more offensive focused, okay. then what we'll get is the weapon Hajime likes to refer to as crossbits. Bits! Omnidirectional gravity controlled weapons that function exactly like how the Ornus golems do. It so these are like golems. Huh. So we took inspiration from that golem labyrinth for this. I didn't even know. But I always wondered, what the fuck are these bits? Because they really appear out of nowhere in season two, right? I'm pretty sure people have explained to me multiple times in YouTube comment sections, but they're just like... I feel like they're just AI at times. They just have a mind of its own. They just do everything. They can just like, create shields. They can just fucking attack. They can fly. They can do everything. Including the feature where they can relay images back. The key difference between those and this, though, is that these seven cross-shaped shields are outfitted with rifles and sh There's seven of them. Noint destroyed one of them. I swear to God, there's always four that's always live with Hajime. But Noint did destroy, like, one of them. Or two of them, I forget. Does... Maybe it's the anime not really giving a shit about, you know, damaged goods, but I was like, oh no, it got destroyed, and then seemingly it just came back all restructured. I'm like, oh, 
because I like that. Shotguns, making them very similar to the aerial assault drones from Call of Duty. Now, I'm sure you probably think that those features are more than enough, but for someone like Hajime, that's just the bare minimum. You see, in addition to all these turrets that make it quite the offensive tool, Hajime also wanted to make it useful on defense. So, by coating each of them with his own diamond skin enchantment, these crossbits would also be covered with shield. a hardened shell of mana, they got allowing shield. them to be used as highly durable shields whenever it was needed. As for a nice little touch to polish things off, well, the last addition to these crossbits was a built-in self-destruct feature. So, Oh, we use that against Freed, right? Yeah, that's like a one last fuck you to free. But then if you self-destruct, I guess that answers my question of how do they come back after being damaged by annoyance. They can just kind of heal itself up. If any one of them were ever being held down by several enemies, then Hajime could just blow it up and take them all out with it. It's a tool that was very crucial to ensuring Hajime's victory here. It's a shame they weren't included, but by keeping four close to him and sending the other three over to Shia, both mm -hmm. had pretty much become these unapproachable boss monsters. Anyone who got too close to the crossbit's radius Wait, of fire would immediately be cut down by a barrage of bullets. So, in terms of overall utility, go back, and go back, go, go back. By ensuring Hajime's victory here. It's a shame they weren't included, but by keeping four close to him and sending the other three over to Shia, both had pretty much become four on three. So just then, so we keep four, Shia gets three, and then come these unapproachable boss monsters. What do you mean they become boss monsters? They did not become these wolf things, no? No, 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 these are the enemies right now, right? Anyone who got too close to the crossbit's radius of fire would am So they're just ready and primed. It's just acts as like permanent guard. It's just like a... It's just bits for Shea. ...immediately be cut down by a barrage of bullets. Okay, okay. So, in terms of overall utility and performance, these would probably have to be Hajime's most useful weapons so far. They're certainly not the last things he'll come up with, but out of the ones we know of, I think they provide the most. I want the bits to like combine and do something cool like transform into a fucking robot why not well, I, wait how, why don't we just straight up fucking build a gun then like straight up I could see something like that why not it kind of goes into Hajime's theme he should just straight up become a gun then but just build a mobile suit and he should have even bigger cannons and laser beams and shit like that why not totally we could do that now, the last unique weapon we've seen in the anime is the 2 meter tall shield that Hajime can equip to his arm just like the pile bunker. It's a heavily reinforced deployable wall This I don't see as much, but I do remember this one, with yeah. the hardest ores Hajime could find in the labyrinth, then coated with Xantium to make it even more durable. Even if something was strong enough to break through that outer layer, so long as the ores within could buy Hajime a couple of seconds- Yeah, I'm starting to realize that he's not gonna explain the fucking satellite weapon, which is the main weapon that I'm curious about. His synergist abilities would always restore it back to perfect condition. Plus, because the inner ore's hardness was proportional to the amount of mana he put into it, that meant that so long as Hajime had mana, the shield could be reinforced to a point many would consider to be indestructible. So we have an indestructible shield. It's a multi-layered build that provides Hajime with numerous options. Huh. A common theme I'm sure you've noticed in a lot of his other weapons. In any case, that's all of his weapons and equipment so far. He does possess various types of bullets. Where's my satellite cannon beam? The fucking Thor's hammer, come on! Where is it? Bullets and grenades, but the ones we've seen so far are all pretty self-explanatory. What I do feel like you need to know though is that everything we've seen here doesn't even scratch the surface of what he's truly capable of. What do you mean? A lot of these weapons get their own upgraded improvements and the brand oh? new ones he ends up making are weapons you'd only imagine in a series like Star Wars. I doubt we'll see any of them anytime soon, but I figured you'd- So in the light novel, his weapons go even crazier. Like we, we're, we haven't even seen, like all those weapons that we've seen right now, they're just basic shit. You'd want to know that things do get a little bit crazy. But How crazy? Yeah, that's How crazy does the power scaling actually get later everything on? Everything that I gotta say for now. If you want to see more- Another great video by Any News. Again, give him a like. Go subscribe to his channel if you haven't. But goddamn, I just wanted to see the fucking satellite beam. You know, in season 2, when Hajime is surrounded by a bunch of monsters. Freed shows up. Okay, it's fucking crazy. UA versus- Freed. UA bodies Freed. Freed has to fucking teleport back home. He has to fucking heal back. And then he teleports back. This motherfucker, after he gets his ass beat, he comes back and he starts saying all this shit to Hajime. saying, ha 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 ha, look at me and look at you. I got all these demon forces circling you. Hajime fucking activates a new weapon. The straight up summons some kind of orb. And then like red beam descend from the heaven 
fucking circles around the stadium. This makes Freed so fucking scared. He just fucking runs away again. But that weapon, some people are saying it's like a satellite cannon. So there's like a satellite in space and Tajmi is somehow using his like magic, I'm sure, and, and the beams. It, it doesn't matter. It, it, it's just a huge weapon. So I guess I'm not sure what the limitations are, but it is a pretty insane weapon. And I'm sure as we get into the future, the weapons are going to get even crazier. One recommendation weapon for me, mobile suit, Gundam. Straight up, I want the bits to fucking just like come together on Hajime and just pop, 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 you know? Just, there's the seven pieces, just fucking one on the head, arm, leg, stuff like that, and turn to a mobile suit, turn to a Gundam. I think that'd be pretty fun. But hey, we do these reactions live on stream, 7 a.m. PST on YouTube and Twitch every day. Weekday, hope to see you there.